What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Brandon, back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. But first, before we get started, a little disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor, and the guest is not giving financial advice. So everything you hear on this podcast is strictly opinion and should not be taken as financial advice. We disclose if we have any holdings discussed in this podcast, and you should not be following us as financial advisors. You should discuss this with professionals before you get involved or invested. And as always, it's not financial advice. So please, please, please take this strictly as our opinions and for entertainment purposes only. Now let's get into the show. What's up, everybody? I am back with another Macro Insights podcast where I got Tom Brickman, the frugal gay, in the waiting room down below. But before we get started, big shout out to my sponsor. Shout out to Pleb Lab. So if you're in Austin, Texas, and you haven't checked out Pleb Lab, what are you doing? You got to get down there. They have the best hacker space in the game where they're putting on events every single weekend, almost every single night. Uh, so you can go and check them out. You can go in there and go for a co-working day. Uh, they actually got Startup Day coming on up on August 21st and 22nd. So be sure to, to, to uh, show up there and uh, come in for Startup Day. I'll be moderating some panels. There'll be some great guests. So be sure to check them out. And if you're out of town and not in Austin, check out the Nomad Pass. Go to pleblab.com and uh, get yourself a Nomad Pass. You get access to all their internal communications, uh, videos of their private events, and much more. So be sure to check them out. And shout out to Idaho Armored Vaults. Bob Coleman and team have been providing you the Best option to purchase precious metals in the game. That's at goldsilvervault.com. You can check out Bob and team where they have the, the lowest margins of any place. So, I mean, if you don't want to break the bank when you're already purchasing these precious metals and selling, you can uh, go to Bob and team at Idaho Armored Vaults, goldsilvervault.com. All right. That's enough for me. Enough of that intro. Let's get Tom up here. Tom, how you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, Tom, for those who don't know you in the audience, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. I am 40 years old. I am from Dallas, Texas, so not that far from you. And I am. I hit financial independence last year, and I left my job at a movie theater because I've been investing in real estate since I was 21. So I am a big real estate investor. And when I say big, it's I have 23 doors right now, so I wouldn't say big to many, but, um, and I am a eBay flipper and that's actually how I was able to acquire my properties while working at a movie theater. I used eBay to grow that down payment amount quicker. Well, that's awesome stuff. Well, okay. Yeah. First that that's a lot to unpack there, right? eBay flipping, real estate investing. It seems like you kind of had the entrepreneurial bug from the beginning, so, you know, what made you, I guess, kind of, I guess, go towards that route and go towards real estate specifically? And uh, yeah, like uh, then I imagine you kind of found real estate and then decided to go to the eBay flipping to, to get the payment. But I'll let you tell that story. So go for it. OK, so I actually started out of necessity in college. I didn't have money for books. I got tuition reimbursement by working at The Gap. So I just had to cover the books. And that was how eBay flipping started. It was to continue to pay for books and parking pass and all the things that don't get reimbursed with tuition reimbursement. So I started on purses, not because I'm a purse collector, but because I was at the a discount store and they had dollar fifty purses and they were a good name brand. And eBay didn't even have buy it now at the time. So I would sell these purses two at a time every week and it paid for my books for that semester. So that was the origins and that was like 2002 ish, 2001, 2002. And um, I always had success with eBay and that was always my fallback. So when I got out of college and I didn't have a job immediately, I was doing eBay as a side hustle and I had a, a job at a bar and um, real estate kind of came in when I was 21 and it was, I didn't want to, I was paying $375 for rent and I'm like, I think I can do better. And I worked at Gap making $850 an hour and they're like, we can loan you like nothing. And then they're like, but if you do a multifamily, we can give you more money because we can use the rent from that multifamily to qualify you. So I'm like, well, sign me up. I'll do that. I'll be a landlord. And um, 
I cashed in my Gap stock, which I had been purchasing um, as part of their employee benefit. And that was my down payment for the, the duplex that I bought when I was 21. And it was a $90,000 duplex and I put down $9,000, got the seller to pay for my closing cost. And that was kind of how it started at 21. I had um, a money pit because I got really cocky. I'm like, well, this went great. So at 22, I went and bought another one, which I had no interest or no business buying because it was just a dud from like day one till when I finally sold it off. And I took a position with a movie theater that moved me to Texas in 2006. And that was how I started growing my portfolio in Texas. Um, the financial crisis obviously happened in 2008. And when I went to go buy my first place in Texas in 2009, they're like, oh, we can't loan you anything. And I got really aggressive with side hustling with eBay with I'm going to get a job. I went and got a second job at Ross and I just used that to pay down any kind of debt that I had. And I started kind of at the bottom. My first place in Texas was $26,000 and just traded up and scaled over time. And that was the origins of how I kind of got into real estate and got started. Yeah, that's awesome stuff. I mean, it definitely seems like you were just grinding your whole way up to try to, um, you know, now now reaching financial independence and, and awesome stuff like that. Um, but, you know, when you transitioned to Texas, right, you moved for a job and everything like that. Did you end up like selling the properties and wherever you were before or did you end up keeping those ones? So I still own door one and two and I still collect rent on it. I collected 14 Fourteen fifty was the rent for this month for the two units, and um, the, it's a paid-off property at this point, and uh, I have a small equity line on it. But uh, that's a great property for me. Property num door number three, I sold that money pit in 2015 when I was just like, I'm done. I wrote a check at, to the title company at closing, and I have zero regret selling that one, even though it's worth way more right now. It was just such a, a weight on me when I wrote that check in 2015 and sold it, it was like, thank you. Just take my money. I don't have to ever think about this house again for the rest of my life. So those ones are gone. And then um, starting in 2009, I just always bought at least one a year in Texas. And then there were a couple years where I'd throw out really low offers. And in 2013, all three came back accepted. And I'm like, well, I'm going to figure this out. And I, I bought three um, in a couple years and two some years. So I just always was like, I'm going to get another one. I'm going to get another one and just keep it growing. So let's talk about the uh, the money pit, right? I mean, you've alluded to it a couple of times. So what describe the property and like what made it a money pit and made it, I guess, like, you know, an investment where even though it's worth a lot more now that it's just was a huge headache. Uh, so the money pit was right outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and I had no team and I had no help and I had like rough tenant after rough tenant because I didn't have systems in place. The city had a very rigorous inspection that you had to go through every year. So there was a lot of upgrades that weren't necessarily upgrades necessary for the property to be maintained. But like one year, they're like, you have faded wallpaper. And I'm like, are you really telling me I have to replace wallpaper because it's faded and how that affects my rent? So anyways, I um, held it for... 10 years, I kept waiting for the value to go up. It plummeted right after in 2008 when everyone else plummeted and um, it was slowly trickling back up and it's continued to go back up since. But in 2015, I, I pulled the plug and sold that one. I had like everything that could go wrong from furnace replacement to bad tenants to I had to do it my first ever. So it was just like one of those that just it never took off. And it was a little three bedroom one bath property outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I gotcha. So it was more so on like, uh, I guess the regular or not the regulations, but kind of like, you know, just the, the maintenance and everything, the upkeep was just kind of more of a headache than what it was worth. Um, but was that property more, I, I, I guess, have you been doing long distance? Uh, it seems like now you're kind of stacking properties in, in Texas. Um, but you know, was Cleveland home before or was that, uh, you know, uh, I guess more of a long distance investment? Yeah, I moved back to Cleveland after I bought that first one. I was from Cleveland and um, went to school in Toledo. So that's how I bought the first duplex was in Toledo, Ohio. 
and I um, had that one, and that one did really well because I had systems in place and I had people that could go and take care of issues, and I didn't have that in Cleveland. So that was why I kind of uh, did not do well in that market. And whenever people are like, hey, here's a deal in Cleveland, I'm like, you can take that to anyone besides me. And I know that there's lots of money to be made there, but it's just that was my experience in that market. Um, and you know, people have that same opinion about Toledo. They're like, oh, I don't want anything to do with Toledo. But I went back to Toledo in 2018 when stuff started to not make sense in Texas anymore. So I've built up that portfolio as well. And um, Toledo just has been a, with the correct people now, has just been a, a better market for me than, than trying to do that in Cleveland. Yeah, so it seems like, you know, it, it's kind of, I guess, the, the base or maybe like the underlying of, you know, what the situation is that can kind of help you with, with you know, not only the deal, but, you know, how, uh, getting the right tenants, doing all that kind of stuff as well. So uh, let's talk about that. You know, what what kind of like you, you talked about, like getting systems in place for somebody who's kind of just getting into the real estate game, investing, whatever, um, you know, I, I guess, what are some of the systems that you can describe that have helped you? And uh, yeah, how do you come about getting these systems or creating them? Uh, over time, trial and error, like, oh, I need someone who can do landscaping. Oh, I need someone who can manage this. I need someone who can respond to this guest right now. So um, that was, you know, I have an excellent plumber who's been with me like all 18 years in Toledo, but it started because I, I was in a plumbing emergency. And then it's just always like, he'll send me invoices. He'll, you know, he, he works with me and it's been a good experience. So I started with a plumber. That was my first. And then that first um, winter in Toledo, I had a furnace, of course, go out and I, okay, now I have an HVAC guy. Now I have this. So it was building up over time, but it's property management. And then your subcontractors, like your tile guy, like your HVAC, like your electrician, like your plumber. And then in addition to that, because the manager doesn't always come through, especially when you're starting out, you're the small one on the totem pole. They're not very worried about that one door because they have this guy over here with 100 doors who gets the priority. So just making sure that what you're paying for is getting taken care of. Like I just, I've gone through a couple of different management companies because of this and I have people that I pay to check on things to make sure that what I'm paying for is actually getting done versus just assuming, okay, they sent me a bill, it's done, I don't have to worry about it. Gotcha. Yeah. And I mean, it, it seems like that's kind of like a general trend when I talk to real estate guys, like the contractors, like they're, they're hard to come by good ones, but when you got good ones, you got to hang on to them uh, uh, as much as you can, you know, do, do whatever you can to, to make them happy. And, uh, you know, those good ones that stick around definitely are, you know, a vital portion of your team. But uh, I want to bring it back, right? I mean, you talked about, you know, when you kind of got started in 01, 02 kind of time period. And that means you, you were investing through 2008, right? So, I mean, let's talk about that experience. How was it, uh, you know, investing in, you know, real estate prior to 2008, like during it and after? Like what kind of, uh, I guess, shifts have you seen in the market? And uh, yeah, what was it like going through all that? So I was not, I wasn't as, I just had those first three doors in 2008 and then I went to 2009, but everything plummeted and everything plummeted to the same level. So Toledo, Ohio had these $15,000 houses or Dallas had these $15,000 houses or condos or whatever it was. So I wasn't, um, I was, I just focused on Dallas cause I was here and I, I thought in my mind, I'm like, oh, it's going to make more sense to, you know, who, where are you going to want to be in the long run? Are you going to want to be in Toledo or are you going to want to be in Texas? And I just knew that the winters were horrible. So I stuck with Texas all those years and, um, I focused on what all the other investors ignored because that's what I had access to and that's what I had money for. So I'd go after, like I, I bought one on the um, courthouse steps and I bought a condo. And when I was watching these other investors, they were like going crazy over these commercial spaces and, and million dollar properties. And I'm over here with my, I bought the condo for $9,501. And um, I the, the investors that were looking at me as I was bidding just thought like, what is this idiot doing over here? But that was kind of, that was what I had access to. That was the 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 money that I had and the skill set that I had. And I didn't compete because when I went for that first property in Texas in 2009, it was a house with, it's like a three bedroom, two bath. And I think that it was a bank owned. And I think the bank was asking 60. And I remember I bid 70 um, on it 
and I was outbid by like twenty thousand dollars. I think it ended up selling for ninety because um, it was just so competitive with these investors who wanted these single families. So I'm like, well, this isn't going to work. I don't want to, you know, go thirty thousand over asking. And what I found was when I would go into them and I would live in them and do a house hack or something that automatically put me at the front of the line because the bank got a credit by selling to an owner occupant. So I would move into some of these and move around and fix them as I was um, living in them and then sell them off after a couple of years and use that to, to trade up and scale up. So I um, was not as aggressive as I could have been when I was just moving this last time. I found this notebook from 2011 with... Um, that I was looking at and house prices and it was like sickening looking at what these prices were in 2011 and looking at them now and now it, you know you see like this $28,000 house and now it's like 280000 because it's just shot up so much and um, I think 2018 I bought in 2017 and, and Texas still got one that year but 2018 was when I'm just like man I can't make anything cash flow here it's just an appreciation. So I'm like, Toledo's been good to me. I want to go back and I want to try this again. And I kind of headed back to Ohio at that point. Yeah. And I mean, it, it seems like, you know, I guess people kind of, when they look at real estate, they like the big flashy deals, but you know, you're, uh, you know, proof in the pudding right here where like, you don't necessarily need those big commercial deals or these, these big old giant, um, you know, multi-million dollar properties in order to, to make it over the long term, right? It's just kind of like stacking those properties uh, slow and steady. So, you know, you started maybe like doing the house hack kind of thing. So describe one, what's house hacking and, you know, what's kind of your, I guess, overall strategy to this day of like real estate investing? Are you short term, long term? You know, are you getting into those commercial deals? Like what kind of things are you looking at now? So I am a mixed bag on that. I do have one commercial space with four units that I own, but it's a residential slash commercial. Um, I have one short term rental currently. The guest was messaging me right before the show because she needed extra keys. And then I have the majority is long term. I have a couple of multi. I do have a bulk of single families and my strategy is I go after what everyone still doesn't want. And even just like, so I completed one last year in August and it had been, it's, it was a bank owned foreclosure and it had been on the market for months and months and months. And it was like a really good property that was really, really ugly. Like the blue bathtub, like all 1970s, but it was like the right spot. And it, and you could tell it was taken care of, but it was, so ugly like all the paneling and all that so i went in and and i purchased that one um i made it look nice again i know like i had over 100 people come through that showing to rent it because i had put in the time energy and effort into that so that's a, a single family that i bought last august that no one else wanted but seven months later when i was done working on it you know a bunch of people wanted it so that's always been a, a strength of mine is to see beyond the ugly and know that I can make this nice. It's not going to be nice right now, but I can bring this one back from the dead. And that's always been a focus. Like, the, so I am a mixed bag still when it comes to real estate. I do long term, I do short term, I do commercial, and I do small multifamily. And I'm open to any deal if it makes sense. And that's a question that I get asked constantly is interest rates are so high. What are you doing? And if the deal still makes sense and there's stuff that still cash flows at seven or eight percent now, I'm still all in. So I've actually bought three this year and um, two of the three have been like out of commission. They had a bad tenant in 2020 and the tenant trashed it and they just let it sit there for two years. So that was uh, another thing that I like to do is try and put houses back in commission that have been out of the uh, realm of real estate for the last couple of years. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. So, so do you have, I, I guess, uh, any background in, uh, I guess, any kind of construction background, maybe the interior design kind of stuff? Like, how do you, uh, how have you been able to, I guess, get this vision when you go into these maybe dilapidated properties where they have, uh, you know, maybe like, like you said, a blue, uh, a blue tub or something that would turn somebody off initially that you can, you know, I guess, see the, the light behind everything and kind of, uh, you know, maybe transform some of these properties into, you know, I guess, usable and, uh, ones that renters desire. So it's, they have a show called the queer eye. So I, I, I have the queer eye. Um, 
And I did help with a lot of theater openings. And there were times where my company would go and buy an old theater and renovate it and turn it into theirs. And then they do ground up. So I didn't have a background in construction. I didn't have family members that really did it. My brother's a roofer um, or was a roofer at one point. But I do have, um, you know, the ability to, one, I was around it at the movie theater when I would do it. So I could see what they could do with, you know, not a ton of money and really transform a space. And two, it was just, even from that first one, like back in 2009, when I bought that first one, it was a really ugly little condo, but I'm like, all right, I've got 2000 bucks. What can I do to make this one? look better. And it was always like, how far can I push this $2,000? Okay, I I can definitely do paint, I can definitely switch out some light fixtures, and just kind of grew from there. And when I look back at my 2009, 2010, 11, 12 stuff, I cringe, because it's all not current anymore. But at the time, it was those were the colors that worked, that was the type of tile that worked. And I had a friend that um, did tile work. And we would just go to Lowe's and we would load up on the clearance tile and, you know, tile walls and and make it work yeah and it sounds sounds like that's basically you know the overarching theme of your entire story is like you just kind of found a way and just made it work um so i guess you know when, when it comes to other kinds of investing right stocks um you know uh i guess even the precious metals crypto bitcoin all that kind of stuff it's very easy to get in and out of things right i mean like something goes down you know you always kind of hear that the joke or, you know, people try to say buy low, sell high, but in reality, people buy high, sell low. Um, but in real estate, it's a lot harder to do that, right? I mean, you you have like 30 to 90 day closing periods. Um, you got to put it on the market. Who knows if somebody's going to buy it? You know, I mean, there's been a house that's been for sale down the street from me since November. Um, so, I mean, the, it, it just takes a lot of time. So, you know, do, do you think because of that factor, it's been kind of, I guess, the underarching like, yeah, I guess reasoning why you've been able to, I guess just, yeah, you know, you've almost been forced to figure things out. Or do you think like, in a sense, you've always kind of had that like innate ability to just been like, you know, roll with the punches, so to speak, and kind of figure it out that way? I mean, I'm, I, I'm a buy and hold investor with every, like, I've got a ton of duds in my stock list that I'm still holding, maybe they'll come back, probably not, but that's okay, because the majority of my money is funneled into real estate. So, um, yeah, I like that it, you know, you can't turn around and sell it tomorrow. I like that that is secure and that's, you know, a $100,000 condo or whatever it is because I can make it produce income until it does sell. And and I just sold one, so now I'm starting to strategically sell ones that just aren't making sense or aren't cash flowing quite as much. And I just recently sold one and and you're right. So from the time the tenant moved out to the time it actually closed, it was about 90 days between us cleaning it up, fixing it up, getting it listed, getting a contract on it, getting it appraised, getting an inspection done and getting it sold. And to me, I kind of like that because it's not something that I can just be like, oh, this isn't working and sell it off and and that. But um, besides my one money pit, I've had very good fortune where I'm buying it at the right price. And that's something that people miss a lot is you got to make that money on the buy side. And that's why I like the ugly ones because sometimes you don't have that appreciation, especially in Ohio. Ohio is a cash flow market. You have very little appreciation. Like that $90,000 duplex that I bought in 2004, that's like 110, 120. So tiny appreciation over 18 years or 19 years at this point. And um, Dallas, on the other hand, has like very little cash flow, but a lot of appreciation. So a mix of both, and that's why I really focus in on both markets is what works for me because i knew if i just did all dallas i would still be working at a movie theater handing out popcorn because i just didn't have the cash flow to actually be able to to tap out and leave my job i had the assets but i didn't have the cash coming in from them yeah and i mean that those are two you know different strategies but you know great things depending on what you want to get out of uh real estate investing so um, well, let's talk about it, right? Because uh, we're, we're in kind of an interesting time, right? You, you alluded to it a little bit where the interest rates are kind of in a, I guess, a, a higher realm than they were the past decade or so, especially like, you know, around COVID where it seems like everything was, you know, 3% and under. So, um, you know, what, what's kind of your strategy right now? And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. 
So I bought that first one, the duplex in 2004, my rate was 6.875. And then I bought the money pit and my rate was like 7.35. So I started in 04 and 05 where those the rates that I'm seeing now were the rates that I started with. And that property in 04 that was in the high sixes, it cash flowed then $300. And that's what I didn't understand through the whole crisis. I was younger and inexperienced, but everyone was panic selling around me. And I'm like, I'm making 300 bucks a month. Like it's still, you know, I understand that I bought it for 90 and it's worth 45 right now. And everyone is like selling, 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 but I'm like, I'm still making my $300. I'm sticking out, you know, it'll come back. These are great little plate. You know, it was a really good location. That's why I still own it. Cause it was a great location and a, a great starter for me. And whenever I put it up for rent, it's like five people apply immediately because they are watching it because they want to live in one of those spots. It's a great spot. But um, I didn't panic sell during the crisis. And and that's why I said some of my stuff in my por stock portfolio, it's probably never going to rebound and that's okay. But um, I'm not one of those buy and hold or I'm sorry, buy and sell investors. Like I'm in it for the long run. I want to see this property improve. Even I had one that I purchased last year and I probably paid a little bit too much. And at this point, I'm probably $60,000 into this property. And um, I just had a $3,600 bill come through for it for plumbing. And I'm like, oh my God, I need to sell this one. But at the same time, I'm like, at this point, you've done everything. You've done the electric, you've done the HVAC, you've done the roof. There's nothing left to break really because it's all been fixed so maybe i should just hold this one so i think i am actually going to hold it as opposed to just selling it but um they're not all home runs and that's something that people you know everyone sees a reel where they're like i made all this money from this and i'm collecting this much from rent and i think that that leads to unrealistic uh expectations out there and and we are you know that's part of like trading apps like Robinwood, they want that instant gratification and they'll sell it immediately and, and buy it. And I'm just not that investor. I just buy and hold and know that that property or that asset can continue to produce income for me. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's the, the, a big thing right there, right? I mean, it's just like the instant gratification, right? I mean, we were kind of like almost programmed for that. You know, we were joking a little bit pre-show, right? About how everybody on social media, you got the trolls and everything like that. The bigger you get, um, but you know, the, I guess the cash flow deals of $300 a month or whatever, isn't necessarily sexy to those people on like, you know, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, those kind of things. They want to see the big deals, but you know, your, your case in point here, right? I mean, you, you said that deal in Cleveland has appreciated maybe 20, 30,000 over 18 years, which is not, not a, you know, not a crazy amount or anything like that, but you know, the amount of cash flow that you're making has allowed you to get to the point where you're at. Um, so uh, you know, between those two different strategies, what we're seeing now, right? I mean, you know, you're, you you kind of described coming up where the interest rates weren't as, I guess, friendly as they were maybe five or six years ago, um, but they're kind of similar to where they're at right now. So, uh, you know, how do you see, I guess, the markets reacting in both of the these different areas, right? I mean, you know, it seems like you're still kind of looking in the Toledo some, somewhat area and the Dallas area, which is more appreciation. So, um, you know, are you seeing like maybe a lower amount of inventory or like less buyers coming in? Kind of what, what, what are you seeing out there? So I'm not seeing the buyers slow down like I thought I would with the higher rates. Uh, definitely less inventory, definitely having to look for those creative deals off market. Because when something halfway decent goes up in either market in Toledo or here, it's going quickly. It's going at or over asking still. So on the one that I just sold, it wasn't like last year where I listed one and I had 13 offers in the first weekend, but I listed it, it was up for 10 days and I got three offers during the 10 days and I accepted one on day 10. So it's still moving, it's just not as aggressive, but it hasn't slowed down people's need to, to like the person who bought it was relocating to Texas and you know doing video chat and doing this and um, I'm not seeing the slowdown that you would expect with the higher rates. Yeah. And it seems like to, to me too, like, I mean, from an investor's perspective uh, or at least from like, you know, from, I guess an outsider looking in, I mean, I have one property, maybe it's going to scoop up another one this year, hopefully, but it seems like investors are still kind of scooping up properties. Whereas 
uh, maybe first time home buyers are are not. So in, in the properties that you're generally looking at, is that kind of like the crowd that you're competing against because you're looking at maybe some of those ones that you can fix up somewhat where it's like mostly, I guess, competing against investors or are you also competing against maybe like the first time home buyers? Typically not the first time home buyers. The property that I'm sitting in right now was probably one of the only move-in ready houses that I have ever bought. And even this one, was ugly and it it was just good bones but it hadn't been updated in many years so that's why we went after this one because it had been on the market for months and this one made sense but typically the ones that i've bought this year they're nowhere near move-in ready so first time home buyers aren't looking at what i'm looking at they might be in the great spot and and one of the ones that we're working on today it's in a great neighborhood but it sat empty since I think he said 2019 was the last time somebody lived in it. He had plumbing issues, which were thousands of dollars for us to fix, and he didn't want to spend thousands of dollars to fix it. So he sold it off to us as is, and we dug up the property and fixed the plumbing issues. Um, but yeah, I'm not. I'm typically not going after anything move-in ready. I'm and even ugly and dated is not my mo. Like I want that to dig up plumbing and and do that because you make the money on the buy side and in, in, in those cases yeah for sure and i mean that that value add that you can bring obviously you know helps with the appreciation and then you know you kind of move move money around so to speak um but all that to say like you know you, you aren't seeing i guess maybe the the buy side uh slow down or anything along those lines um but you know, I, I feel like the buying side of things might have changed a little bit in the past couple of years, meaning that, you know, as you described like earlier on when you were kind of first getting into those single family homes and, you know, maybe it was a bank listed property, people, you know, were outbidding that by like 30, 40 grand on, you know, a $60,000 property of what it was listed at. It seemed like during COVID that was kind of like the similar thing, except for those properties were listed at you know, three, 400,000 in, in areas like you're in right now in Dallas, I'm in, you know, Tampa, Florida, as we speak. So, you know, in this area, maybe in Austin, Nashville, like those kind of like prime areas, are you still seeing that? Or are you seeing kind of, I guess, prices come back to life, so to speak? Um, you know, when you're, when you're kind of looking at these properties, I'm still seeing those higher prices. Like it's, just, I'm not seeing any 60 or $70,000 houses in, in Dallas. Toledo, even the rougher properties, and that's what I, I see a lot of in Toledo, are investors trying to go in and buy something, and they don't understand Toledo or the condition of the property, and then they're trying to exit three months later. They're like, oh, this is a lot bigger project than I thought. So I'm seeing that in Toledo where people will enter and exit quickly. In Dallas, I am... <sighs> everything is still selling like just even the the properties that need a ton of work like there are people waiting to buy those and get into the next flip or the next project so it's tough and it's a tight market and even when i listed the one that i sold i'm like man we you could buy a lot or you could buy this condo and that's the cheapest thing in this zip code um if you want to be in the school district and and whatnot so I'm not seeing the prices reduce like you would expect with where we're at. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting because it does seem like here, you know, from the brief houses that I've looked at that maybe it's, it's certain areas, maybe it's the property or what, but it seems like, you know, people are still asking a lot and there might not be as many people bidding on those houses. You know, I kind of described the house down the street from me. Um, you know, just anecdotally, it was on the, a house. There's two houses for sale. One was all fixed up and basically move in ready. That was on the market for 480. Uh, somebody scooped that up fairly shortly after it was on the market. And uh, yeah, they're happy family living in there now. This other house definitely needed some work. It was, uh, I believe, listed at like 460 or so. Uh, and then they, you know, moved it all the way down to 390, maybe even lower. And I think I just saw it got sold recently at like 360. But like I said, it was on the market at, you know, 490 or for whatever, you know, like a hundred thousand more than, than it ended up being purchased at. So maybe that was just like kind of a one-off that I'm, that I'm seeing down here. Um, but you know, what, what about the rental markets? You know, obviously you're, you're a landlord and everything like that. Right. I mean, the, even if housing prices are going down, it seems like kind of in a recession that, you know, rent st stays pretty sticky and that, you know, people are always kind of look for, uh, you know, a place to live. So, are you seeing rent demand change or anything along those lines? I'm not seeing um, 
I'm seeing increases in rent, but I'm not seeing any decrease in rental applicants when I put something up for rent. Um, I am shocked at how much some of the, like the one that we just sold, we probably could have upped the rent, but it was like a small two bedroom and, and renting that for $1,700 just didn't sit right with me. So I'm seeing a continued increase and no slowing on the demand. So when I put one up, I think I told you about the one I did in August when I put that up, we had a hundred people through in two showings. So it still isn't where I expected. And then um, there is one that we were doing upgrades at and we gave them notice that, hey, you guys are in month to month, so we got to put you back in 12 months leases, and this is what your new rate's going to be if, if you want to continue to stay. And originally, both tenants were like, we're going to go. And then they went and looked at what everything else was, and they were like floored at the amount of, of increase it has been in the past two years of them living with us versus what it is now. So they ended up staying and signing new leases. So I think that... Um, rent in both cities has not slowed down um i'm seeing it slow a little bit as far as increases because it was going up quite a bit but i'm not seeing the demand slow okay yeah and that, that's interesting and that's kind of what i what i assumed as well you know just kind of like looking at it but it seems like you know in, in this environment uh you know my i guess my kind of prediction is that you know first time home buyers like we described are a little bit more wary of buying homes um so they're you know going to wait so to speak until those interest rates come down how far they'll come down we don't really know i kind of doubt we'll see like the three percent that we saw you know during those COVID times but um you know that's neither here nor there but they're they're kind of waiting for their their first time to to purchase a home and so in that they're looking to rent you know either nicer homes nicer apartment complexes or, or things like that so the demand for renting is going to go up and you know in a sense i would make you know higher competition and uh you know making for rent to go up in a lot of these these bigger cities um so you know you've been through i guess investing into you know, uh, various, obviously, you know, the, the great financial crisis of 2008. So is that something that you kind of saw during that time as well, that, you know, rent was still fairly sticky, although, you know, homes prices were, you know, somewhat, I, I guess, falling from the from the sky? Yeah, I didn't see rent prices decrease, but I didn't see them increase. They just kind of stayed still. I was in, in Texas at the time. I was renting at the time. And, um, there was a slight increase. I'm going to say it was like $10 when I was going into my second or my third year um, at this place that I was renting. And that's when I ended up buying. I didn't do a, a, a third year renewal there. I was still in my second year. But um, yeah, the, um, the markets that I'm in, they have been consistent with, I haven't seen rent decreases, but I also haven't seen the exorbitant amount of over-improvement that some markets have where people are trying to rent thing, you know, a, a studio for $3,000. I'm not in New York or, or San Francisco, and I've never rented from or seen someone in, in my areas that that's doing that over-improvement. Yeah. So it seems like that's kind of the key, right? I just like understanding the market, understanding, you know, what, what you're all putting into it, um, you know, that kind of stuff, which takes like time and research and, you know, uh, maybe, maybe something along those lines. So did you ever have like, I guess, um, you know, you kind of described your experience in the, the movie theater kind of, you know, looking at what, making things look nice, but also being affordable kind of from, from the back end of things. Did you have like a mentor or anything like that when it came to, um, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, how much to do in a property, like kind of that stuff, or was it one of those situations kind of, uh, you know, as you have be going through your story where you just figured it out? I figured it out, but I will say this. I had my dad and my grandma come out and look at that duplex, uh, the first duplex. And we had three that we looked at, and then there was one that I really liked. And then there were the two just to show them. So they're not driving out to Toledo without something to see. And the one that I loved, they were both like, this sucks. You're not living here no and then i remember standing on the one that i bought and my grandma's like you're living here and you're going to live in the ugly unit and this is how it is and of course i wanted to live in the nice pretty unit but i saw how much the rent could be for that and she was right so i did have that guidance my grandma was a realtor um my dad had one rental property when we were growing up so 
I had that exposure, but as far as what to improve or how much to improve, everything is always safety related. So anything safety issues, that gets the immediate. And then anything cosmetic, we can do upgrades as warranted. And this is what I have money for. So there were a lot of times, like even there was one that I bought in 2018 and the roof was really bad and all I had left over was $3,000. And what I ultimately did with that one was I did half the roof and then I came back the next year and did the other half of the roof when I had the money for it. So it was one of those that you'll figure it out as you go. And like with that one, I'm like, I didn't, you know, until I said it, cause I was talking to the guy who did the roof for me. He's like, yeah, we can do half and we can come back and do this half next year, you know, when you have the money. So I think that, and trial and error there were like i remember one of the first ones i did in dallas i put in this ikea flooring it was horrific and horrible by the time i was done and i'm like oh i'm never using ikea flooring again so now 18 years in i'm going to use those same finishes because i know that they last i'm going to use the same toilets i'm going to use the same tile because i've made tons of mistakes over 18 years putting in this that doesn't work or even i just had to replace a two and a half year old furnace and or a two and a half year old air conditioner and i'm like man this should the warranty when we came and they're like, Oh, you didn't register it in time. They didn't stand behind their product at all. And that was, uh, I purchased it in 2020 and every, the brand that I wanted or the brand that I use everywhere was out of stock and I just got a bad batch and it was an expensive lesson. So there's a reason that I stick with these certain brands because typically they last longer and they have a better warranty and you don't want to make that, Oh, it's flashy and pretty mistake that I made with the Ikea flooring when I did that first one. So how do you go about like pricing out some of these, uh, you know, rehabs and other things like that, right? Because I feel like that's a big part of the deal is like kind of, you know, they, they call it the ARV, right? The after repair value, uh, kind of looking at the purchase price, looking at what you can do for things. Um, you know, how, are you looking at those kind of things before or are you just kind of, uh, you know, necessarily just saying like, hey, this is what I think I could rent it out for if I just make these improvements? Uh, definitely want to know the ARV so I can get the cash back out when I'm doing the improvements. And, um, I mean, there's a model by square footage, which doesn't really always work, but, um, I just, so I bought one in March. We're almost about to finish it. They are doing finishes right now in the property. And, um, we estimated 35,000 for the renovation. I think we're going to end up at about 36 to 37,000, depending on where the plumbing all comes in, which is done now. Um, and our ARV is almost spot on where we said it was in March. So, so, and same with our rents, like we were starting to look at, do we want to sell this one? Do we want to rent it? And I think that we're going to hold it just because the rents were spot on where we thought. And then there's ones that I've gone into. There was a project that I did during 2020 where I started in December of 2020. And by the time I was doing some of the work, like by the time we got to the roof, the price had doubled because of the shortage of supplies and inflation. And that was one that I ended up $40,000 over budget because once everything was in, it took a year by the between inspections and that it just everything was double on a lot of it. And that was one that I could have never seen coming. And that's one that people would say that I over improved and I'm finally catching up to market now. But I didn't know that when I started, I didn't see the, the lumber shooting up. I didn't see the, th- those things. And that was, you know, that happens. That's part of this. And that's something, you know, always have your backup, your contingency plan, your emergency fund. And that's one thing that I always try and share to people. They're like, I have $20,000. I'm like, okay, if we put this $20,000 down on the house, what do you have to fix it? What do you have when the furnace goes out? So I never encourage people to, you know, invest every single penny that they have. Cause that tenant doesn't care if you have the money or not. They want their furnace on when it's the middle of winter and it's 10 degrees outside. And if it's broke, it's on you to fix it and get creative. So that is key. And I see a lot of people when they do enter, just be like, okay, I have 20,000 and put in everything that they have. And that's did not end well for me. So I would not, and I didn't have any, like when the furnace went out for me, I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? And I had to muddle around and figure it out and got a home equity line and, and try and get this furnace in quickly and efficiently for the person that was paying me rent. And I see investors skipping that sometimes. 
Yeah. And I mean, it definitely, you know, you know, that, that strategy, <laughs> just dumping in all of your 20 grand that you have could, could end up, you know, working out, but it also, you know, it leaves yourself out for a, a ton of risk. Right. Um, which I mean, you lined out with, with furnaces. I mean, there's different examples like all over the country, right. I mean, here in Florida, for example, like a hurricane or something can hit, you need a new roof, something along those lines too. So, um, but you know, I guess uh, we, we've kind of talked about the market, you know, some of the strategies and other things like that. Um, but it does seem like there's a lot of, I guess, underlying issues in the economy. If you're following along, right. I mean, we have student loan payments about to start opening up. We have unemployment kind of going up, right? We have the Fed kind of continuing to raise interest rates. So a lot of underlying things uh, going on. Um, so, you know, I guess as an over, as a real estate investor, are you are you like monitoring any, any of these things, um, like when it comes to the overall economy? And uh, if so, like how does that, I guess, sway your decision whether to buy or sell or what? Um, monitoring? No. I, am I? Yes, I'm on Twitter. So I see the news. Yes, I'm on there. However, I go into everything right now, even the two that the one that I bought in March and the one that I bought in April with multiple exit plans. Does it make sense to sell? Does it make sense to cash out? Does it make sense to rent? And I think that that's important as well. Like, so there's a lot of times where I'll buy a property and I don't know where I'm going with it. I know I could do this, this or this, and it really fluctuates. And maybe something there was one that i bought in february and it was going to be a rental and then it didn't look like it was made sense so it it was a property that got sold and i think that that's important too because people are like oh i'm only going to flip this or oh i'm only going to rent this and i think having that things can change and you need a backup plan when things change if things change if you get stuck in a, a fluctuating rate or a, a arm that comes to or a loan that comes to what makes sense for you on that. And I think that that is important as well. Yeah, I got you on all that. Well, Tom, you've been, uh, you know, very generous with your time and I really appreciate you coming on. Why don't you tell people, you know, what you got going on and where they can find you? Yeah, I am. I have a newsletter at housemoneymedia.com and at housemoneymedia on Twitter. And I have a podcast, House Money Podcast, that I do with Alan Corey and with Lauren Amon Keen. And we brought the three of us together to share our strengths. Lauren is a short-term investor. I am a long or a buy and hold and a out-of-state investor. And Alan's just like a hodgepodge of hot mess. So the three of us together turns out something good. So we've got the podcast. We've got the um, newsletter that comes out weekly. And I am at the Frugal Gay 11 on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Yeah. And uh, Lauren and uh, Alan have also been on the podcast as well. So you guys always, uh, you know, bring the heat when it comes to real estate. So I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, yeah, big things ahead for House Money Media. I think like you guys just dropped your, what is it, first or second episode fairly, fairly recently. Yeah, we're four in. We just recorded four five in. and six last week. So um, it is rolling and we're excited with the progress and with the feedback. Yeah. Yes. So Great thank you for having right. me. I'm, I'm the third. I'm the last one here, but that's OK. We always save the best for last. Yeah, exactly. So everybody should go check out their podcast and everything that uh, Tom and uh, House Money Media has got going on. So, Tom, thanks so much, man. Thank you.